A research proposal generally has this structure you can see on the left-hand side of the screen here. You'll cover an introduction, a literature review, a proposed methodology, a statement of ethics, a proposed time frame, and a statement of what the significance of the study will be. We'll walk through each of these steps and what to include in each step for a general research proposal. These steps are also covered in the templates that you can download through the link in the description. The templates will have explanations of what to cover in each section in more detail, as well as some helpful AI prompts to help you brainstorm what to write in each section specifically for the project that you are working on. The introduction will have an orientation to the research project. You'll introduce your research question and you'll introduce the aims and objectives of the study. Starting with the orientation, you can consider this like a regular introduction for an essay, giving you an overview of what will be covered throughout the research proposal. Then you would want to introduce your research question. This is generally a one sentence question that you're going to attempt to answer through your study. If you haven't come up with a research question yet, you could use ChatGPT to help you out. You can see on the screen here, there's a prompt that I ask ChatGPT to give me some research question ideas for a research study. Be aware that your research question will likely evolve over time, especially once you've completed your literature review and identified a research gap. So present a research question here as a draft with the knowledge that you'll come back and change it later on. Lastly, in the introduction, you'll want to present some aims and objectives. This is usually about three subpoints that will demonstrate how you will go about addressing the research question. Again, you can see here, you can use ChatGPT prompts to give you some ideas. They're probably not going to be perfect, but it's a good brainstorming step for you to get started. You can pause the screen to read that prompt. It took me a while to fiddle around with that prompt to find one that comes up with some good answers. And of course, I've included that prompt in the template that you can grab in the description. We'll move on to our literature review now. Once you finish the introduction, you will write a literature review that explores past studies that have looked at the phenomenon or topic that you're studying. The idea is that you want to demonstrate what is currently known about the topic and ideally what is currently not known about the topic. That is where your research gap comes in. So the way I usually do this is I read all of the literature and try to fit the literature into a few key themes. If you're an undergrad, you might only be expected to do a paragraph or two for each theme. Whereas if you're a master's student, you might be expected to do a more detailed overview. I've done a whole video on how to do a literature review and how to use AI to help you go about that process. But a quick guide here, you're likely going to want to go to Google Scholar or your university's online database to find studies. So you can see here for a homework in kindergarten study, I search Google Scholar homework kindergarten, all the studies will pop up. I'll need to sort through that and find the studies that are relevant. I'll open the PDFs, read the PDFs sort the information I found in each of the studies into a series of themes, and then discuss each theme. When discussing each theme, you would discuss the studies and what they discuss under each theme section. You would then want to end your literature review with what we call a research gap or a statement of what hasn't been covered by the literature yet. A quick tip for the research gap. My students always find this one the most difficult point because they think they need to find a brand new study that's never been done before. What I generally recommend to my students is to choose a topic that they find interesting and you can always find a research gap by inserting modifiers within your research question to zoom in on a focus that hasn't been covered. So for example, you can narrow your research study down to studying specific types of people or specific locations or unique methodologies. Here is a real life example. So if someone wanted to do the question, how do parents believe homework in kindergarten affects children's cognitive development? Well, that study's probably already been done, but we can add a modifier like working class parents. And there's probably no studies that have been conducted that look specifically at working class parents. Then your study will have a unique contribution to the literature by focusing specifically on a certain type of person. Again, you can use AI to help you think and brainstorm this. There's a prompt here asking the AI to come up with some possible research gaps. Remember that AI will help you brainstorm, but it's often wrong and often doesn't get to the best possible research gaps. So use it as a starting point to help you brainstorm, but you need to use your own critical thinking and come up with your own research gaps. Remembering AI is a brainstorming tool, not a silver bullet that's going to help you ace university without using your brain. Okay, now that you've done your literature review, you would move on to your methodology. The general structure of your methodology section is that you'll want to start by stating what methodology you're using, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, or a mix of the two. Then you would zoom down into the data collection methods. 
whether it's through interviews, questionnaires, focus groups, Likert scales, or any other way in which you'll collect your data. Once you've stated what data collection method you're going to use, you would then move on to stating what your data analysis method is. In a qualitative study, your data analysis method is likely to be thematic analysis, although there are other methods. In a quantitative study, you might do something like an ANOVA, which stands for analysis of variance or a factor analysis or something similar to that. To make this easier for you, the majority of undergraduate students in a social sciences program such as psychology, sociology, education, nursing, and similar fields, the vast majority of those students are going to start out with a qualitative study doing semi-structured interviews and thematic analysis. Generally, that's because it is the easiest way to go about a study and it helps you learn the fundamentals of conducting qualitative studies without having to go into the more difficult strategies and methods. I've given you the structure here of what to include in the methodology section, but if you need some more guided help, you're gonna to have to grab those templates where I walk you through what to cover in each of these three points, and I give you some AI prompts again to help generate some brainstormed samples that can keep you on track. But remember, of course, you always need to write it yourself using AI only as a brainstorming tool. The next section you need to cover after completing the methodology is your validity and reliability section. In quantitative research, we will call this validity and reliability. In qualitative research, those terms don't really fit, so we usually follow the structure of discussing credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. Now, of course, this is quite difficult and confusing, so I'll show you a way to find some ideas to cover for both quantitative and qualitative research. I've left in the description links to two articles, one that talks about validity and reliability in quantitative research, and one that talks about these four factors in qualitative research. So open the one that's relevant to your research study, whether you're doing quantitative or qualitative, and I'll show you how to grab some information. So right now we're in the validity and reliability in quantitative studies article, and we're going to use Harper AI, that's H-A-R-P-A, you can download it as a Chrome extension, and we're gonna ask it to, using the phrase backslash ask, ask it to read the article for us. And then once it's analyzed the article, we can then ask this AI tool to come up with some ideas for reliability and validity for our study. So I've set, entered a prompt here that says, this is the study I'm doing. Um, it's gonna be quantitative using Likert scales. Can you suggest some ways to demonstrate reliability and validity? It's going to read this academic article and come up with some suggestions. Okay, and there you go. You can see that it's come up with a bunch of suggestions of ways that you can uh, ensure validity and reliability in your study. Now let's jump over to the qualitative one and see how it works. So over in this qualitative article, I did a similar prompt where I asked it to cover some ways to demonstrate credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability in my study. And it's given me an answer of how I can do that, relying on this academic study to come up with the answers. So this can form the background or the basis of what you write in your section on reliability and validity, or if it's a quality of study, these four terms, credibility, transferability, etc. Remember, and I have to stress it again, you cannot submit AI content as work you've completed. So you really do need to make sure that you've got a good understanding of these articles and write it in your own words. But the AI has been really helpful in helping you brainstorm and think through things that you can talk about here. Moving on to the fourth section, this is where you discuss the ethical considerations. Ethical considerations that you could consider discussing include anonymizing names of people who are in your study, ensuring that you store all records in a locked box, informed consent, so making sure that the people who are participating in your study are informed about what they're doing, ensuring confidentiality, and probably most importantly, receiving approval from your ethics committee. That will be a step that you'll need to do at some point in your research program. These are just a few of the ethical considerations in the templates. I outline many more that you could cover in the ethics section. Next up, you'll do a time frame section. This is a really easy section. You just need to map out which months or weeks you will cover which section in the study to show to the person grading your research proposal that the study is feasible within the amount of time covered and that you've thought that through. Generally, students will use a Gantt chart for that. So you can see a Gantt chart on the screen right now. You can grab that Gantt chart. It's part of the pack that you can download in the description. And then you would want to conclude your research proposal by discussing the significance of the study, 
which means concluding by saying how will the study contribute to current literature and knowledge on the topic, why this contribution might be significant, so why is it important that you do the study, and hopefully what real life implications that might have. Again, you could rely on AI here to help you brainstorm this. You can pause the screen now to read that prompt, but basically it says, give me some ideas to talk about what the real life impacts of this study will be or what will its significance be? Why should I be doing this study essentially? And then it'll spit out some examples. You can look at those examples and use them to help you brainstorm. And then of course, in your own words, write what you think the significance of the study is. All right, this is one of the most complex templates that I've had to come up with for you, but I've given you very detailed outlines in the research proposal template about what to cover in each section, and those prompts will help you brainstorm ideas specifically for your study along the way. So grab that, it'll help you structure how to write a research proposal. Remember, this is a general research proposal for social sciences when you're conducting a primary research project. I highly recommend that once you've done this general draft, take it to your teacher or supervisor and ask them what should be included or removed. Every supervisor and every institution have their own nuanced ideas about things. So you really do need to get some feedback and support along the way. This template will be a good starting point, but it's not the be all and end all of what to submit.